ahead and jump right in. Welcome everyone, thanks for being here today. Um, we are hosting our second of the Rebuilding Our Local Economy webinar series. Um, this is a series that People First Economy is hosting over the year, broken up into four quarters to better serve our members with technical support and resources in the community. Today, we're gonna to be chatting a bit about um, the future of work with some awesome thought leaders and partners in our community. Um, and so I first just kind of want to go ahead and introduce those folks. Um, I'll give you an opportunity here a little bit later to, to shout out what your businesses do and how you're involved in the community. But um, if you just want to wave your hands and, and let us know who you are, I don't think our names are saved in the recording. So um, that will be helpful to folks who are tuning in later. But we have Edwin Colazzo, who is the owner of City Built Brewing Company. Um, Hello. Hey, hey, thanks for being here, Edwin. Thanks for having me. Uh, Jill DeYoung, who's the co-founder of Locate. Thanks for being here, Jill. Thank you. Andrea Turan, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, the Director of Operations at Catalyst Partners is here with us as well. Thank you all for being here. Um, Local First, People First Economy wanted to host this conversation with all of you, um, championing various industries with different experiences throughout the pandemic to talk a little bit about the future of work because we know that as more people are moving through the vaccination process and in-person gatherings are back on the horizon, local businesses are continuing to address the consumer and employee expectations that exist, as well as addressing social inequities that are shifting their business practice based on a new set of global standards. Um, and so today we're gonna to talk through a number of things, um, kind of the future of supporting local, what brick and mortar spaces look like now, their potential for the future, what's happening in the short term, the long term, um, and how businesses are addressing and publicly sharing their values um, actively along pursuing racial and environmental justice as well. So um, thank you all for being here and being willing to share those various perspectives with us and your leadership in these different spaces. Um, I'll introduce myself as well for those who don't know me. I'm Kathleen Rourke, the membership director here at People First Economy. Um, and so I have the privilege of chatting with a lot of our members, hearing, um, you know, what is going really well, rocking for our businesses and those areas where there are gaps and some uh, additional knowledge or opportunities are available. Um, and so this certainly, this conversation is certainly one of those places. Um, and so as we're jumping in, I'd love to hear from our panelists, if you wouldn't mind first kind of going down the line, introducing your business. Um, and then if you could tell us, you know, along with your business introduction, what your kind of current daily operations as a business look like, your current capacity, you know, if your employees or consumers are inside your business these days. Um, and then we can really jump into some questions that are, are here. Um, so Jill, if you want to kick us off. Sure. Um, again, my name is Jill DeYoung, and I co-founded a web app uh, that allows customers to discover, browse, and shop their local independent merchants and local makers all in one place. Um, our team, um, my partner, is local, and then we have two software engineers. And the way we've been working is really um, we distribute work using uh, a collabor collaboration of tools to communicate and manage um, our projects. Um, we're also out in the community talking to local merchants and makers, um, especially now that things have opened up even more so, um, and engaging with uh, consumers in a variety of ways. Um, Andrea, can you tell us a little bit about Catalyst Partners and kind of what your current operations look like? Yeah, um, so Catalyst Partners is a service-based business. So um, I've been working there for 11 years and we have we focus on sustainability and health and wellness of buildings. And we offer consulting for building certifications as, as well as um, commissioning and on-site performance testing of buildings. So um, for us, the pandemic has helped bring a lot of awareness to air quality in buildings and how the buildings uh, in being inside a building affects our, our health and wellness. So um, we have um, about 75% of our employees work locally in the West Michigan area. Um, however, we all are, about 95% of us are still working primarily from home. We have started to return to the office uh, for occasional meetings here and there. 
um, and the rest of our employees and team members have always been working remotely. Uh, so we've become very familiar with uh, their daily lives of working remotely and working in a virtual world. So um, we do, we have local clients and um, throughout the US and worldwide. So we have been comfortable working remotely. We did have all of the platforms when the pandemic began to start working remotely. Very cool. Awesome. And Edwin, you want to share a little bit about City Built Brewing these days and what you all are up to? Sure. Uh, my name is Edwin Colazzo, and I'm one of the co-founders of City Built Brewing Company. Uh, we're currently um, at 25% capacity inside. Um, we understand that we can actually open up. However, we've situated um, our business so that we can have a walk-up counter. And so we spend a, a lot of the space is spent uh, with uh, a line in mind. And so that way we can corral more people. Um, and so, and those are, these are all things that we're actually reconsidering with everything that was just shared yesterday. Um, I actually was out of town and so I'm coming back to, to that. So um, yeah, so we've, we've uh, done what we can to stay busy, but mainly we've concentrated on um, building an outdoor area that hopefully attracts people. And so while we have about 50 seats inside, we have 148 seats um, outside. Very cool. I just saw an article that came out today or maybe a few days and maybe a few days late gathering our mail um, all about your outdoor spaces, Edwin. So cool to hear a little bit about what you are, you're doing there. Um, and intrigued by all the various levels of current kind of work capacity among these businesses. So being fully in person, that kind of flex space that was pre-existing the pandemic, but um, informs the pandemic response there at Catalyst and then the shifting kind of consumer perspective, Edwin at, at City Built. Um, yeah, awesome to see that variety. And I think that'll be really important as we're navigating through these questions too. So um, just out of curiosity, uh, one fun thing I thought um, to start off this conversation would be if you could imagine that the pandemic no longer was an active concern, what kind of restriction, service or pandemic offering would you just be ready to shed? Just like kind of popcorn style, what one thing if you could cut it today or, or change it today, would you, would you do? Is that for me? Any, for anyone. Yeah. Oh, um, I don't think there's any, I think we've learned more things that we're going to keep mm. than there's any, than there's any one thing that we want to necessarily want to stop. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't like wearing a mask, but I do all the time. Uh, even when you don't, you know, our biggest, I guess the one thing I'd love is, is not to have people from outside our space come in our space and disrespect our staff in our space. But I think that's the hardest part. Um, is that first person that meets every person that comes to City Belt. Yeah. That can be so like heavy. That extra layer of communication that exists from the business level to say this is what our assumed or expected behavior is for you coming Correct. into the space. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, anything that stands out from Locus or Catalyst that if the pandemic was just not an active concern, you would do it differently moving forward few things. I mean, wearing a mask. I don't think anybody really likes that. Um, not being able to travel and see our clients in person. Uh, we're ready and our buildings, we're ready to be done with that. And for me, looking at myself on video and video conferences, I'm so over that and ready to just look at other people in person and stop looking at myself all the time. Oh, yeah. I I hear you there. I feel like in the age of recording where things are going to be virtual and then and then kept for a long while, it's like you don't realize how much or like what your response faces look like or how much you dislike your own voice until it is on the ether forever. <laughs> um, I agree. Cool. Anything from your perspective at Locus still? I was just going to chime in. I, you know, it's interesting because our company is very new and we started just a couple months prior to COVID um, hitting with really um, getting out in the community and then pulling back. Mm -hmm. So our small team um, has rarely met in person. Um, it will be nice to have that time to gather 
and um, share our ideas um, mm -hmm. moving forward together. And being out in the community, you know, we were able to do that as we piloted our platform, our web app, um, but it feels so much better now as things are lifting and getting to know our um, customers and the shops in the community better. Even Kathleen, I met you the first time on video and then it was fun to see you in public, but with a mask. So right. we're all enjoying this. Yeah, it's one of those reverse scenarios. You do meet someone in person for the first time. Right. Um, we've seen each other's face on video, but then I'm half cover, you know, all of the keeping everyone safe. But yeah, right. I'm ready to reverse that order. <laughs> that will be so lovely. Um, you know, I think we already started to, to touch on this a little bit as far as, you know, meeting with folks and, and being in person and just the value of relationship in general. But um, I think, Edwin, you, you really kind of um, tapped on this most specifically, but again, open to anyone. Um, we just noticed that consumer habits have been shifting significantly during the pandemic throughout the course of it, and that consumer habits have really flipped a few times over as far as um, what's acceptable with safety and uh, also people's inclination or what people want to be seeing in those different spaces. Um, so as we've seen that to be true throughout this last year and know that people have more access to the vaccine, uh, I'm interested to hear you know, what, it, what you think the, the future of shopping local looks like in those brick and mortar spaces coming into businesses, whether that's the short term or the long haul. Um, and so Edwin, I know you kind of tapped on that a little bit as far as consumer habits being in the brick and mortar space. Um, so if you have thoughts on that, but again, anyone is welcome to jump in there. Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, I think, you know, in the short term, uh, as restrictions are lifting and um, Michigan's and entering into the summer of tourism, uh, we're going to expect that you're gonna have a boost in traffic in the restaurants and in the small shops, and it's gonna feel great. Um, although I don't know from the research I'm seeing and the people we're talking to that the pre-pandemic levels um, will necessarily be the same. I think the health and safety concerns will still play a role in how people are feeling in large groups or, or capacities like that. Um, and I think what remains to be seen is um, how this traffic will actually convert for these local shops um, into sales, um, or will it be just more of a social leisurely um, activity? And um, how will it, you know, sustain itself moving forward? Um, I think that independent retailers are just starting to feel good about it and getting on their feet. And now is a great time for consumers to really be pointed in that direction for restaurants and for local shops. Um, I think um, for the long term, um, the outlook for independent retailers, um, you know, kind of maintaining this momentum that they have over the big box and the, um, you know, the Amazon, um, they have that because of the personalization that they offer and the knowledgeable, you know, experienced staff. So, um, and I, you know, again, let's face it, it's really nice to go in a store, especially now and have that experience um, and that it's, it's enjoyment. Um, so in addition to that, I think that stores need to um, continually find ways to create the digitalized world. And um, what does that look like? That seamless, intuitive, and exciting experience for the customer needs to be there. Yeah, I feel like you've found a few things that are really interesting. Jill, we've seen almost a trend throughout the pandemic season to right that beginning frenzy period where everyone was trying to figure out how do we support local, what does it even look like, who is online, and recognizing that for a, a number of businesses, some um, had the infrastructure in their business to be in those positions, some did not. Um, and so this trend through the pandemic to begin supporting businesses online, but then as we're looking at that long haul or, or that coming out of this pandemic season, um, how much of business will be continued to be conducted online versus the pent up demand to be in person at places and have those unique experiences. So interesting to see how those trends are kind of fluctuating. Um, but I agree there's so much conversation right now around how businesses continue to diversify their revenue stream, having an, an engaging online presence while making their, their place-based business, their brick and mortar business, um, an intriguing one or continue to making that an intriguing one for people to come and have relationship-based transactions. 
any other thoughts on kind of the shifting consumer habits and you know shopping in person, online, long haul and short term? What what we've noticed um, is everyone goes out on the weekend, and so we have these just killer weekends, and then uh, and we're starting to see this change with warmer days, but during the week, people aren't going out. They're not moving as much. Um, we don't see as many people downtown. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of empty offices. And so all these businesses that built up with the expectation of a busy community or busy mm -hmm. um, building, um, that's not necessarily the case. And so um, at, for our business, we used to be open from 11 a.m. until 11 p.m. almost every day. Um, and now we're open only six days a week. And we are open from, well, this is changing too as it gets warmer, but we're open from three to, we were open from three to nine. And then Fridays and Saturdays, we'd be open from 12 to nine. And so what we what we're seeing is, is we're doing the same sales in way less amount of hours, way less labor than we've ever done, uh, which is great. And so now it's just trying to understand what we put back, you know, what fits. Um, but I don't see city belt doing lunch for quite a while or at least until maybe the spectrum building is built which is right next to us and so i mean there's a lot of things i think we've changed i think what stands out is how the service feels from the consumer side so we're all short staffed um we have very talented people just leaving our industry uh and so not necessarily what's left isn't talented it's just there's not enough and so um what we see when we go in other places is, man, you got to wait 45 minutes to, to eat. And they aren't necessarily willing to take reservations anymore because we can't afford for this table to sit empty for 15 minutes or make someone else not have that experience because they see there's an open table. And it seems like people are very frustrated when they come into our space. Um, not everybody, but people. And so, um, you know, we don't see ourselves doing table service again. Um, our staff feel more comfortable behind the counter. It's only three feet. And, you know, I don't think it's, it makes that big a difference. However, you know, when I speak in front of people, I love speaking behind a podium versus not, you know? And so um, I, what I see, and just, we just had lunch at the Mitten Brewing 20 minutes ago. And just to see how the few staff that were there behaved and how that played out with the people who were coming in, it's just, it's an interesting study on human behavior. Um, but I, you know, I just, I don't, dining out isn't necessarily feel how it used to. Could I just ask a question, Edwin? I, I'm curious, what is some of the feedback you're getting from um, customers coming in? Uh, what are you hearing? In terms of uh, recently, as things have started to loosen a bit, um, the capacity has changed a bit. Um, I know I've been out a little bit and I've been listening to what customers are saying and asking restaurant, you know, the waiter and, and waitresses how it feels. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I guess we see people are very frustrated that City Built has decided to continue to mandate that you wear a mask from your table, you know, from the door to your table and from your table to the bathroom or from your table to uh, the bar to order. Um, so we get, what I realized about our business is the type of clientele that we had prior to uh, COVID, uh, that personality type tends to be okay with wearing a mask in our space. They respect that that's what we're doing, but not every place and, you know, in Grand Rapids is like that, that, let alone outside of Grand Rapids once you start to get into rural areas. Um, but, but by far the hardest position at City Bill is the person who greets people because they, they have to be the gatekeeper for the entire restaurant. And so they're the person that's dumping, hey, by the way, there's no table service. Hey, by the way, you got to go to the counter. And when you do, you have to wear that mask. Um, by the way, you have a table of seven. You can't sit seven. We only allow six. So you're going to split up or get to sit outside. Um, and so there's all these things that you just, or consumers just were um, used to, I guess, and that we don't allow. And so, but we've been very consistent, I think, since the beginning of, I mean, the beginning we had like a six foot table in between us 
and the folks that would come in and we'd take a hockey stick and shoot your order to you across this table. And so we try to make it fun. Um, yeah. So I, I guess what I hear the most is why are we, why are we, I guess what I'm told that we hear the most is, you know, why is your rule still this, but the governor's, you know, that governor said, you know, X. Uh, and it doesn't matter, the age doesn't matter either, I'm noticing. And so this weekend, uh, I was doing dishes and uh, because we're short staff. And uh, we had a, a group of young people come in and they're like, you know, I don't, my governor says I don't have to do that. So I'm not gonna. And they're very rude. They eventually made it to a table. And so I came out and introduced myself and just said, hey, what's going on? You know, we're just trying to keep people safe. Uh, you can, you know, choose to stay and follow the rule or you can choose to leave. We hope you stay, but you'll follow the rule. And so uh, I've become a very big advocate for my staff uh, whenever I can, uh, while also trying to be, you know, you, you can't always drop it. You have to have more than one tool and it can't always be a hammer. So uh, and one of my employees actually was you know, laughing at me. She's like, I came out to hear you yell at people and you had them laughing by the time you left. And so it's just such a fine line of, of trying to hold people accountable and keep your people safe because it, it doesn't matter what I think about masks and COVID. The people who work for me are very anxious uh, and mainly because they don't feel cared for by the people who come in. Um, and so, and, and they're rallying back. It's, it's pretty interesting, I think, to see an entire culture of service it's just not as hospitable anymore. It's pretty wild, I think. And not just at Cityville, everywhere. Thank you for sharing some of those stories and also your experience centering your people first, your employees first, making sure that they're safe, making sure that even the interaction between your consumer and, and your product and service um, is one that's based on relationship. Because I think, you know, there's that that language out there that you can't hate things up close, right? When you come to the table and you explain, this is my business, I'm passionate about it. We want our employees to be safe and people end up laughing in that exchange. I do think that that is, a, is really um, a demonstration of how much our local economy is resilient when it is relationship-based um, or that we can get over some of these hurdles when we are relationship-based. Um, so that's a pretty cool story. Awesome. Um, I think this actually leans kind of into our next question here. So, um, Andrew, I don't want to, uh, if you have any other pieces to add to that, we'd love to hear it. And I don't want to cut you off or we can jump into this next question. Uh, yeah, for us, uh, um, I mean, we're not necessarily a brick and mortar. Um, we're an office building. So I think we'll just have, we were busting at the seams before the pandemic in terms of how much space we had inside the office. And I think now as people return to work on and off, we just won't need a bigger office building um, for a while. So I think that is, is helpful for us. And I think we'll just have more virtual meetings because people have found that's more convenient. Yeah, absolutely. I think it'll be interesting. I've heard from a number of folks something that People First Economy especially does with our Local First program um, is connect with national IBAs or, or by locals independent business associations who are doing similar work um, across the nation. And I've heard time and time again from some of those folks that um, for us, particularly as a, a nonprofit in our position working with members, we miss those member to member interactions and being with our members. But there's something that is so efficient about having committee meetings or any number of kind of group gatherings that usually would have us across the city all day long kind of thing in some of these spaces. And so what it might look like to have a more flexible schedule or um, more of a hybrid schedule, um, which I know Andrew, you had mentioned exists for Catalyst Partner before, Catalyst Partners before the pandemic as well. So um, interesting to consider that kind of function too. Yeah. Um, so one of the other pieces and that we had been discussing and as I was thinking about kind of our next question here, I think it leads in really well is thinking about how we're centering some of the people in our businesses as we're looking toward opening up. So recently, um, Christine Cogden, the director of the Global Research Communications at Steelcase had been quoted in the Grand Rapids Business Journal saying something to the effect of, um, if working from home was originally a big experiment on a global scale, we're now entering a new global experiment where we're being asked to consider how we give workers the opportunity and the autonomy and flexibility to choose what works best for them. 
um, and yet make them feel like they're still rooted in the organization and connected to their fellow coworkers and the sense of shared purpose that exists in the office place. Um, and so I kind of just want to pose that back to all of you. I know you have various structures presently and those structures for working with your staff members and coworkers will change here in the near future, but what does it look like for your businesses to um, keep this in mind and center the employee as you're coming back to offer autonomy and flexibility? What elements are you considering in some of that? Um, I can start. We, we really have tried to give our employees as much autonomy and flexibility in terms of their schedule and um, where, when, and how they work just because of the industry that we're in and the type of work that we do, um, they're able to be flexible with that. So um, it's become much more valuable, I think, during this time with so many employees having kids home from school or home from daycare um, and just juggling work schedules with partners um, so I think that definitely will continue to offer that flexibility and autonomy. And, um, you know, I think that that will continue to be very val valuable to our employees. Um, but in terms of still feeling connected, I think that's honestly something that we've struggled with in a virtual world as an organization is still feeling connected and, um, having, we just miss those day-to-day -day interactions that you have when you're in physical presence together that it's just not natural in a virtual setting. So um, currently we have a Monday morning meeting with all of our employees and um, that's just become much more of, um, I guess, much more valuable as well in terms of seeing people, hearing what's going on and checking in with each other. And then we've also just had more scheduled virtual meetings where we check in with each other and ask how, how we're doing and um, just try to replicate that physical interaction um, type, type setting. So I think uh, as we move forward, our employees will continue to have the option to choose whether they want to work from home or work from um, the office. And I think it will just be more common to work from home. So people will feel more comfortable doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds a bit too like allowing someone to have that autonomy over their schedule then means that they can prioritize their family that they've had at home, the other, the other kind of benefits that come along with some of those pieces of being able to flex your schedule, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your all staff meetings too that have been virtual, um, different components. Can you chat a little bit more about what those look like when you've met in gathering space, how those have become more important spaces over the pandemic? Yeah, um, in terms of just the meeting itself and the interactions and... Yeah, I know everyone's held different kind of formats for being you know, virtual versus in-person um, organization has had, you know, a few more mandatory in-person, you know, as we've all become vaccinated and, and back into the office and getting some of that sort of like water cooler chat that you would have in a traditional sense, right? Um, yeah. Versus some of the, the virtual components. So um, in what ways have you like helped to craft those to be engaging for your employees? Sure. Um, I would say definitely adding video has been valuable. When we used to have meetings, we video was on and off optional. Um, I think that just realizing that seeing people and just seeing facial expressions and um, you know body language is very valuable versus an email, for example, uh, where you don't get that. So also. Um, just opening up our, our virtual meetings, they used to be very structured, very timely. Um, so just making them a little longer and just adding a little bit of a personal update rather than just um, what's going on at work for you this week. So um, just opening up the floor for people to share what's going on with them personally as well um, has been really valuable for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I've noticed in, in some virtual meetings, things have become really efficient, right? Or um, we, we almost get to the point very quickly. And so coming back to add those more humanized elements or allowing each other to be a little bit more human in some of those virtual spaces um, has been so important in various meetings. Um, you know, Edwin, I'm also really curious to hear from your perspective what, what this looks like a bit. I know you had mentioned uh, that you and a few others had gone over to the Mitten Brewing and just saw what their experience was there. I know they've also recently launched um, a beer that all of the revenue sales from that beer is going toward mental health uh, free services for their employees as you know, a function of recognizing that particularly restaurants have had, you know, there's labor shortages, there's burnout in mental capacity as being the gatekeeper. Um, can you share a little bit more about your experience? Maybe you're seeing holistically in the restaurant industry, but also um, at City Built in creating some of those, um, you know, newer boundaries for your employees or really safeguarding them, championing them like you were kind of expressing before. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, uh, the beer is the things we don't say. Um, I'm, that was why I went to the Mitten today is to check that beer out. So, um, and uh, what a cool thing that they're doing for their staff. Uh, I know people, um, so I know of people from their staff that took advantage of, of um, mental health services at the place that they are sponsoring prior to the beer mm -hmm. that Mitten helped, that Mitten helped, you know, before they had, they had done this push. And so they've been doing really neat things for the employees for a long time. Um, in terms of how we're in the process of, of uh, planning a getaway with our, with our employees. And so we're looking for a spot where we can kind of still be socially distant, but all stay in the same property. And, um, and we're going to close for a day and just take two full days uh, for those who are interested and float down a river and play, you know, uh, yard games um, and do the things that we, you know, didn't get to do last year because we had a, close or, or we had to cancel the bridge party and then didn't get to do as a staff in the summer because we always do this uh, back, uh, back uh, yard Olympics. Um, so all these things that we typically do as a staff that make working at uh, a brewery or at City Belt fun is all the camaraderie that comes with it. And so and we've done a lot of really neat things as a business over the last year, but it's very rare that our, our employees outside of in our space kind of commiserate, celebrate, uh, and, and talk about that stuff. It's all, I mean, a lot of times they're just, they're finding out online, uh, we're getting better at communicating those things, but they're finding out not even from us that, you know, all these cool things that are happening to city build are happening. But, um, in terms, in terms of, of mental health, I, uh, we've always been respectful of, um, their, their work time away from city built. Uh, people get to choose their their um, their hours. Uh, we don't have the benefit of working from you know from virtually, um, and that's fine. Um, I'm not sure that a lot of our staff could endure. Be, you know, sometimes for some of them the anxiety was just being home alone, uh, not being able you know not being able to go out, and uh, oftentimes people in our industry self medicate, and so and they do that in a group. <laughs> And so they didn't have that. Um, and so that can be tough. And so, a lot, I mean, uh, my wife and I sat outside of City Bill on Saturday. Yeah, on Saturday till like two in the morning with four of our staff. And we were just, just talking and laughing. And, and it, was, it felt pretty close to normal, um, you know, which was wild. My wife and I came home. And I was like, man, when's the last time we sat up that late? Uh, let alone outside of city belt. And so it was really cool. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question, but, you know, just, I think we're re a lot of folks who are working our industry not to, they seem like they're extroverts. The reality is, is they go to work and that's a stage hurts, you know? And so all the things that are happening around them tends to compound the issues that are so that that an introvert would would deal with yeah and, you know if that makes any sense yeah that makes a great deal of sense and thank you for sharing those stories too because i do think 
that really does pull on this kind of question of how we're centering people because those relationships among your staff matter, those relationships with owners matter, knowing that an employee can come to, especially in, you know, in, in our organization, in organizations, um, you know, like, like yourselves, restaurants, maybe they don't typically have, you know, a specific HR person that someone can come to and say, this is really tough, or I'm fighting this consumer, expected consumer behavior of a mask to a table, um, and just having a person to come to, to express those things, um, creates an environment for an employee where they can feel enabled, where they can feel, um, like they have backup, right, support for enforcing, uh, you know, restrictions that are outside of our control. So that is huge, that is huge. Um, you know, kind of moving away from this a little bit too, I, I know that there are a few, um, you know, examples, we talked a little bit about mint brewing, and I know others have created, you know, opportunities amid this that do center uh, the employee. One that comes to mind too is the Hispanic Center had recently launched a unity fund for businesses. So um, less the business centering the employee, but allowing the business um, to center the employee by, by having paid sick leave matches for people who had tested positive. Um, I don't believe that fund is open any longer, but all of these opportunities that have come out amid, um, you know, a time that did feel like it was restrictive, there have been lots of these things that have flourished from that time, right? Whether it is the relationship, whether it is creating these opportunities for businesses then to fund um, the employee to put their health their health first or um, using almost this social enterprise type concept of, of beer sales to fund mental health. You know, all of these things matter when you're sending the employee. Um, stepping away from that a little bit, we've also noticed that consumers are driving demand for both local and global businesses alike to start more publicly sharing their values and be active in seeking justice. Um, People First Economy, we recently hosted earlier this year, a conversation with Ben and Jerry's global social missions director. One thing that stuck out from that conversation, many things actually, if, if you haven't, this is a shameless plug. If you've not seen it, we still have that video available for small donation. Um, we would love to share it with folks and I can certainly follow that up in our uh, blog post where we will share this recaptured video as well. Um, but the director there had shared that their company can, could almost be reframed to be described as a group of activists who sell ice cream rather than an ice cream business that, um, you know, achieves or goes after um, activist concepts through their business. And so I'm curious um, what that might look like for all of you and your businesses as you're looking to champion equitable access or opportunities um, and to champion social justice through your businesses. Um, is this something that you're actively seeking to do? And if you do that, can you give an example um, of where that occurs within your business? I can um, go ahead and start. And you know, I kind of go back to, we are such a new company and um, we've been virtually meeting for over a year, uh, but we've talked a lot about this and what does it mean? Our platform hosts local merchants and makers and in communities and neighborhoods. And so, We've talked about brands today that are recognized um, in order, they, they create this meaningful and lasting relationship with consumers by tapping into people's sense of self and what are their values. Um, you know, kind of what does it look like to create a, a shared identity with the customers, the shops to provide a better and, you know, authentic and motivate a brand that's, that feels real. Um, so we have conversations about that, um, and, and how do we see that working for our business, um, is really, we built this platform to filter, um, by neighborhoods. Um, so you have a sense of community when a consumer goes on our platform, Locus and browses or shops, you can filter by ownership of, um, the, the local merchant or maker. So it's that intentional understanding of where your dollars are going and the values creating the alignment there is what we talk a lot about and, and building and growing that out, um, listening to the merchants, what's important to them, listening to the consumers and how does that feel? Absolutely, I love, um, I love hearing from you, Jill, how that is baked into the beginning of your business model rather than this reactive or what can sometimes feel like a reaction of, you know, now we're up against this circumstance where we're being asked to speak for businesses who fit maybe this 
you know, slice of the pie, but it's, it's built into your, your website, your shopping platform um, from the beginning, which is a pretty cool thing. Thanks. We've tried to be very intentional. Um, it's been very important to us, but of course, there's always learning. There's always listening, and that's where we are too. It's a growth. Um, from from our perspective, um, I think that this is something that we are, it's something that we talk about too, and that is important to us and our um, employees are definitely passionate about and speak up about. So we are talking about it. We're um, planning a retreat Um this fall for our employees where we're going to work through some of these things. And um, financially, we support various nonprofit organizations. So something that we did um, last year in 2020 before the end of the year was poll our employees to ask them, what nonprofit organizations are you passionate about? What organizations do you want to support? And a lot of them ended up being... um, related to social justice. And that was, so we ended up uh, financially supporting many of those organizations that our employees were were passionate about. So um, I think we are looking, looking for resources in terms of how we can do a better job of this and continuing to ask our employees, you know, what's important to you and how can we, um, how can our organization support support those values. Absolutely. Um, I was, I'm also thinking, or I'm reminded for Catalyst Partners, I know uh, Catalyst Partners is also plugged in a bit to our Good for Michigan programming. And so as Catalyst Partners has been a part of Good for Michigan and measuring their impacts through the existing tools um, here and in other places, right, with like blood certification and, and things like that, what it looks like for um, for your business, especially as, or lead certification, I should say that, you know, I know this. Um, as as you're looking toward working towards some environmental justice components to what that looks like for your business or how that's centered, especially while you're working with you know other businesses, other brick and mortar buildings or clients that you're supporting. Yeah, um, environmental justice justice is something that we are very passionate about, and um, we want to. It's something that we like to help our clients with, and that we do ourselves. Our own building is. Um, LEED certified, and we're also currently working through well certification, so it's a, a health and wellness certification for the building. Um, and um, yeah, LEED certification, uh, living building challenge, and working towards creating our own energy, and um, we have solar panels on our building, we have uh, geothermal wells for heating and cooling. Um, We have operable windows and we don't use our lights very often. Um, So we are working towards uh, net zero or net positive uh, by 2030. So that is definitely an issue that we are are very passionate about and um, are passionate about helping our clients as well. Thank you for sharing. And could you expand upon net positive? I think folks might um, have familiarity with what net zero might look like for, for businesses who are working toward net positive. What What is kind of captured in that? So the goal is to create more energy than what we're currently using on site. So um, for us, that, that looks like something we did recently was um, took down the siding on our our building and um, we sealed the entire envelope of our building. We added um, insulation and then resealed it. So that's, we're trying to reduce the amount of energy that we use first of all. And then um, net positive means that we we will create more energy than we end up using in the building. So that will go back to the grid for, for other organizations to use. So using less less water, less um, electrical energy, and um, 
just less resources in general. Something else that we do is try to capture rainwater on site. Um, we have rain gardens throughout um, our landscaping to try to capture water so that doesn't run off into the, the sewer system and potentially pollute the, the lakes and, and uh, rivers in our area. Awesome, thank you for sharing a bit more about, you know, how you model some of that within your business and then how you bring some of those components to, to the clients that you're serving. That's very cool. Um, Edwin, anything that you'd wanna share from City Built's perspective, how you're um, using your business to champion social justice or environmental justice initiatives? Sure, so um, I used to be a financial advisor prior to being at Northwestern Mutual and uh, North or City Built uh, was uh, a place for me to affect a culture in a positive way. Mm -hmm whether that be our staff or our neighborhood or community. And so as a brewery, we have to think about how what we do affects our environment. So for every gallon of beer, we use nine gallons of water. And so um, it's a tough position to be in as people who uh, respect our environment, we can't get outside of that. And so then we've gone further to try to capture some of that water. And so unfortunately, the city works again we can't do it so we can't use it for gray while we can having everybody take takeout food now is tough uh we've been searching for solutions that would help us just organize the plastic cups if we could just you know make that, that change and so we think we found an organization we just have to figure out how to collect them so i mean they're part of uh Black is Beautiful, which is a beer that we made in collaboration uh, with Weathered Souls, which is a brewery in actually many breweries, but they started it out of Texas. And uh, we made a pretty good donation to two different local organizations, uh, one uh, being Life Class Ministries uh, and the other um, uh, being the Black Urban League. And so um, we have a volunteer we had prior to COVID, we had a volunteer coordinator that would uh, set up monthly um, opportunities for our staff to uh, get involved and to go to a local organization and help. Uh, so that way we could give with our time and not just our money. Um, but then as a Hispanic guy in West Michigan, my role is to uh, be representative of my culture in a way that is, you know, what the city built is good on purpose. Um, we, we want to attract people to and entertain and, and, and I guess turn them on to what it is to feel Puerto Rican culture, eat Puerto Rican food, uh, to feel like, you know, when you feel when you go to my grandmother's house, it's like two o'clock and all of a sudden she's putting food in front of you and you're like, where did this come from in our space? And so uh, we do a lot of, of, of things to stand out. Um, when COVID happened, uh, one of the things that we realized right away was if we ever want to be good brewers, we needed to be good marketers. Uh, and so being good marketers has allowed us to brew more, turn our tanks more, which has allowed us to become better to craft. Uh, and then and, uh, standing up and being uh, local and intentional about how we spend our time and where we spend our time and money uh, is a big part of that. Absolutely. I think we're seeing more and more. Um, I think the idea of transparent budgeting has been around for a while, but I think we're seeing more and more from, you know, the racial injustices that we've seen this year, from, well, not just this year, right, but named this year and existing for a long, long time. Um, and other, other equity issues that have popped up this year, just the transparency is a huge function and consumers are really driving. They wanna know um, what businesses are supporting and how to use their, their money in a values aligned way with our local businesses, with the global businesses that they support, um, B corporations that are either uh, inside Michigan or, or outside Michigan, um, but really championing or using their dollars to vote for the kind of communities that they really wanna see develop and become strong and resilient in their place. Um, and so all of these initiatives are so important. Thank you for sharing what it looks like through each of your businesses to begin to champion that, to bake it in from the beginning, to use 
um, you know, the employees focus as well also in, in creating that value is in your place. Um, those are awesome initiatives. I'm glad to hear about them. Uh, you know, the last kind of question that I have for you is, and, and, and Edwin, you had already kind of alluded to this a little bit in some of your earlier answers, but what, if anything at all, do you think is going to permanently change in your business operation or generally in our local economy? So I know, Edwin, you had said the, the pandemic really showed you right from the early on what kind of things you might change um, more permanently with your business. So would you mind kicking us off with this question? Sure, sure. One of, the, one of the first things that we did is we evaluated when people came to City Built, and then we decided just to be open then. And so we were able to eliminate a ton of hours. Um, because we're short staffed, uh, we decided, all right, we can only afford one shift. And, and actually, we only have one shift of kitchen. And, they're, um, and that shift is also a person, two people short. But on Fridays and Saturdays, all those people work two shifts. And so um, trying to figure out how we could do more with less has been a big part of um, the changes we've made. Uh, we used to do uh, a ton of different Puerto Rican dishes and they all are very labor intensive. And so we've changed what we prepare, how we prepare it. Um, we, you know, we used to be or call ourselves Puerto Rican inspired. And so now I just call ourselves Puerto Rican because we're kind of doing Puerto Rican food. So we do have some of those flavors, but like in the end, we're just a taco joint that has, you know, our flavor in those tacos. Um, but the table service, I mean, it seems like we all are making more money. So City Built is doing almost the same as before on less hours with less labor. Our staff are, um, we got rid of positions. So we used to have kind of like a middle of the road position that was tipped out as well, but they made nine or $10 an hour. Uh, we no longer have that position. Everybody who works in the front of the house are either a server um, or not. And so that server though has to do all the jobs. And so what we do is we tip share across the entire company, uh, which we did before, but now those tips leave, they don't necessarily stay in the front of the house. We started to uh, guarantee kind of a, so basically our servers have to make X and they typically do. And once they hit, uh, once they hit that mark and then the tips open up to the kitchen. And then if it hits the next mark, then it opens up to our brewers. And so for, for example, our brewers weren't even at work on Saturday and they made $40 each and, and there's two. Uh, and then our kitchen all got three or $4 an hour raise because they got to be on the tip pool. And so that would never have happened had we been doing table service. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how our business has changed or how our service model has changed and how the flow of the tap room has changed as a result big part of that is having all the outdoor seating. Um, I don't get to choose whether that stays or goes, but my hope is that it stays. Uh, but you walk in the city belt and you look in the front of the house and it looks like we're dead. Uh, and then you walk into the kitchen and you see a seven foot rail of tickets that go down to the floor and you're like, where are all these people? And then you go outside Well, they're all outside or it's to go, you know? And so there's some things that changed that we had to do to stay, um, engage with our community and part of that was online ordering that now we have to turn off by a certain time every night because we're so busy um however it's still great to have that opportunity or still have that option for the days that we aren't super busy um so i, I guess i never realized how much the sun plays a role actually i don't think it played a role in our business before but man if the sun's out we'd crush if it's raining, it's, it's a harder day, <laughs> you know, it's just not, it's not as good. Uh, and so it's, it's wild how the weather plays such a big role in our daily success. Uh, and we've been very fortunate to great weather. Yeah. Awesome. It, the, the new model that you've created with your employees, as far as tip sharing goes, the kind of team orientation that is a part of that so that everyone profits from excellent service or good product that gets to the table. Um, that is really interesting, especially amid this, this labor shortage um, in the industry. It's really interesting to hear about that. One of the things that we tried to do four years ago when we opened was try to eliminate that kind of wall that exists between front of the house and back of the house. And so you have these relationships 
because on a busy Friday or Saturday, you serve as a server, you might make 300 bucks. The kitchen makes the same amount, whether we're busy or whether we're slow. And so what's their uh, impetus to celebrate the busy day if it's just way harder and I don't do better. And so this kind of, this kind of removes that. Uh, and it, it does truly kind of put everyone on the same team. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Awesome. Jill, Andrea, anything that you think will maybe permanently change or change for the long haul in your business structures or in your offerings? Yeah. Um, I can't imagine Edwin being in the, the restaurant industry through this. You've had to make so many quick changes and tough decisions. And um, I just give you a lot of credit for that. Um, Thanks. I have such a good staff around me. I promise you, I had a lot, a lot of help, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, I definitely restaurants have been one of the most affected, I think, in terms of businesses. For us, um, I think that um, air quality testing and uh, well certification have, have become more important to our clients. And so we're currently working through well certification for our, our business. We've been doing some air quality testing, um, healthy building audits to help organizations find out what, what they can do to better their buildings to support their employees and their customers. Um, as well as um, offering employment to employees who are permanently remote. That's something that we've done before, but it's more, uh, we can do more easily now. And um, also we are planning to implement an employee assistance program. That is something that our employees have had a hard year <laughs> as well as you know everyone has, but um, just making sure that we have resources available for them if they need support from, from our organization, as well as if they, you know, don't feel comfortable uh, coming to us, we want to have an employee assistance program in place um, so that they can seek help elsewhere. So that, that's something that we plan to permanently continue, as well as we found creative ways to to get together and have meetings. We met outdoors at a park last July. We're gonna be doing that again soon. So I think just more outdoor meetings that will continue for us too. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, at Local First, we're hoping to bring our coffee hour series back in person. And we're so fortunate for you know the timing of the vaccine rollout, the timing of you know the, the seasons here too, um, to be able to offer some of those back at park services here coming up. So it's more of a sneak preview for us, but yeah, I agree. Just being able to be in person outside, whether that's with your staff, Local First also popped over to City Built a few weeks back and we were able to be in person over good food and good brews. Um, and that is just, there's something so meaningful about being in person with your people again. Um, so it's cool to hear about that. I know we're running or butting up on our time. So um, I will, I would love Andrea to hear a little bit more about what kind of things are a part of your employee assistance. Um, for those who are going to take advantage of it. And Jill, if you have any other feedback, I don't know if we'll have time for any questions and answers, but would love to hear those kind of last remaining thoughts before we wrap up today. Yeah, I'll quickly talk about our employee assistance program. Um, it's not been implemented yet, but the plans are for um, just a lot of educational materials for employees on stress support and um, working from home, for example, um, resources for mental health support, substance abuse support, connections with local organizations, um, hotlines, um, educational support for, for leadership, for how to work with employees who might be struggling, how to bring people back from um, you know, when they come back to work after be, being out for any sort of leave. Um, so those are just some of the things that we have found a need for um, and that we plan to implement over the next few months. That's great. Thank you for sharing a little bit about that. Um, and Jill, any final thoughts before we kind of wrap up about changes that you think will be here for the long haul? 
Yeah, sure. Um, this is something we're constantly looking at um, and talking to merchants about. Obviously, um, e-commerce changed the landscape for local independent brick and mortars. Uh, COVID changed it even more. And as you said, Andrea, you feel for the restaurants, you feel for these local shops. What does it look like moving forward? There's always going to be a local brick and mortar. Um, people want the experience. People want the service, the personalization. That's not going away. But um, what is changing and what we're trying to work with too is, um, you know, the competition is no longer against small businesses within the community or neighborhoods. It's now really against the players and um, what that looks like and, and meeting the consumer where they are is changing and evolving. And we are there to work with that and, and work with the merchants on that. And, um, you know, I, it's the consumer really who's going to be dictating who's going to be here to stay and who's going to fade away and how they handle that. And we'd like to be a big part of them. Great. Well, thank you all for being here to just chat a little bit about what the future of work looks like, how you're actively pursuing that in your businesses right now, um, for sharing your experiences of change over the pandemic and um, all the ways in which you're centering people and, uh, you know, regenerative um, components for our economy here as we're opening back up and looking at the pandemic season coming to a close. So um, I just thank you for your experience and, and sharing those locally here and your transparency. Um, we will be posting this conversation to the Local First blog. So folks who have watched today, people who want to come back to this if they were unable, will have access to this content. Um, and any of the resources or thought kind of concepts that we've shared today, we'll make sure to post some of those. So thank you everyone for your time and just enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. Thank you.